Well, Mr. President, the sailor. Thank you. <laughs> well, General Bob Kingston, Mr. President, Mr. Keene, Mr. David Leibertson, Mr. Secretary of State, Mr. Keene, Mr. Keene, Mr. Keene, George, why don't you come down and get in the middle here? We rearranged yes, the picture there. Yes, sir. 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 Yes, I was a little embarrassed when we were in the Situation Room the other day. I thought, that's the first time I've been in a meeting with you when I didn't bring a few charts along. <laughs> so I, I thought I'd better, better bring some. Well, Jack, I just want to say, you know, welcome home, but the inklings that we've had so far is that uh, there must have been some progress there, and we're all grateful to you and looking forward to it. Let me move this a little closer. I thought. Well, listen, if this is all that's coming, why, we don't need the back rows there anymore. <laughs> Can you see these, Mr. President? Yep. Okay. Uh, before we started, this is a big work of uh, the NSC staff and Mr. Children. Come in, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, Jim, thank you for doing it, Mr. President. Well, uh, George didn't do a great job. <laughs> uh, Jim did a great job, too. You are well served. Mr. President, I got news for you. <laughs> George will tell you, and, and so then, there's not much I didn't read. I'll give it to Jim, sir. Thank you. I was a son lover from, yeah, I was yeah. a lifeguard for seven years when I was yeah, young, yeah. Now that, to find out that it, all that double-crossed me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what they told me. They said uh, that my, my dermatologist said I had a skinny man that was 20 years older than I was. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give up the afternoon. Oh, no, no. Uh, but, cover, but cover your head there yeah, and right. wear uh, um, plenty of uh, sunscreen. sunscreen. Yeah. That's right. All right. All right. Very nice to see you. Yeah, good okay. to see you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, congratulations. Very oh, nice to see you. Oh, my. My yeah. Sue, you yeah. spoke yeah. earlier. Congratulations yeah. to you, too. Thank you. Good. Uh, all right. Which way? Uh, oh, okay. go out this way. Thank, right. you. Thank you. You bet. Bye. You sent our
question. No, I don't know. I don't Wally Campbell. Yeah. Good to see you again. All the rest of Well, please. Don't let Don't let Nice to see you. Hello, Howard. How are you? Mr. President, this is a very distinguished group, most of whom you know, that is indeed engaged in a labor of love uh, because they believe it is in the national uh, interest to uh, keep our economic and security assistance programs moving. It's an unpopular and difficult cause, but they have done a magnificent job in getting their organization off the ground. Uh, we're fighting an extremely difficult battle, but uh, without them, we'd be in a lot worse shape than we are today, so I think we owe them a, a vote of gratitude. Well, yes, and I welcome the opportunity to share with you my concerns over the short-sighted approach that the Congress has taken in cutting my request for funding in the foreign affairs field. Since 1985, Congress has slashed appropriations for foreign affairs programs by one-third. And that's a far greater reduction for other portions of the budget. In fact, our foreign programs cost less than two cents out of each budget dollar. Nearly all the money we put out in loans and grants is spent right back here in the United States, creating jobs and bolstering our economy. And our economic development aid goes to countries in the developing world, which provide 40% of the market for our exports. Our money spent on military assistance means our allies and friends join us in defending our and their security. And I can tell you that costs a lot less, as you well know, than having to send American boys over there. At the levels now set by Congress, down 15% from what we requested, we will not be able to keep our commitments to countries where support is vital to our own national security. But I'm preaching to the choir when I talk with Citizens Network. In fact, uh, I want to hear more about your efforts and plans uh, to impress on Americans the paramount importance to them of maintaining adequate funding in our in our foreign affairs programs. And I think you know you have both my gratitude and my support. Well, Mr. President, uh, as a network, Affairs, to try to do what we can to uh, alert the American public on the need for Regular meetings with the Joint Chiefs. We haven't been around for quite a while. We're delighted to have this one. 
and uh, we have planned for you for this one a presentation of the of the uh, Sakyur and Sikyur, who are, uh, both happen to be General Galvin, and uh, uh, the, both the responsibilities as well as the general uh, strategy and resources for dealing with uh, the defense of NATO Europe. And Frank, did you want to? No, sure. You're in the chairman. So, chairman um, meeting. rather than take any more time, uh, we're going to turn it over to Admiral Crow and General Gal. Well, Mr. President, I just wanted to say again how much we appreciate the opportunity to meet with you yeah. on frequent occasions. And as we mentioned at the last meeting, we're going to, with your approval, we're going to try and bring in some of the major unified commanders and have them discuss their warfighting strategy. I think it's appropriate that we commence this sequence with John. So he's a very capable guy, and I think he's up to the challenge. Yeah, Thank you, Bill. Mr. President, uh, coming in here in the presence of the secretaries and, and the vice president and you and all the rest, uh, it reminds me of uh, the fact that the uh, four-star general has got a lot of people that are up there. <laughs> Thank you. Including now won't be waterborne, it'll be horseborne at times, and uh, so therefore uh, there's a western belt just to well, I'll open the door for you. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> All right. It be a pleasure working here. Well, pleased to have you aboard. Thank you. Sir, Woody is, uh, is a ship driver, so you'll be able to answer all your questions about the islands offshore much better than I could. <laughs> <laughs> Coming straight from two years at sea, well, so that was unfair of me the first time out to the ranch where you could see the islands out there in the channel. I took advantage of it and was trying to get her to identify them for me, but. Uh, <laughs> She'd been in the other ocean. Uh, <laughs> there will be set this time. Yeah. Well, all right. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And again. Thank you. Folks, introduce yourselves uh, as the president comes around. Hey, hello. How are you doing, sir? Hello, Hello, I'm Joanne. Hello, 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 Joanne. I'll be there. Mr. Bush, thank you. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. It's not on my mind, so. Well, good. <laughs> good. <laughs> thank you. That's what we're hoping to do. Well, please. I want to sit down here. Whoops. Start with one chair. <laughs> we uh, want to say, first off, I don't know how these things work, but this is okay for me to uh, say a word. Uh, uh, Mr. President, we're, we're so grateful for your willingness to uh, meet with this um, uh, task force and uh, your interest uh, along the way, as you called me right after the General Assembly's um, decision. Uh, and uh, it's just one more indication of always, I think, your willingness to meet with groups that want to meet with you. I remember back in the days of the uh, Vietnam and Cambodian problem when you met with the people in the, in the fellowship hall of our church and uh, tried to share your, your feelings there and you were so gracious then. And, and one more indication of uh, your wanting to hear from uh, uh, other people and, uh, and your church. Uh, these, are, these are friends and uh, Christians who uh, have a great concern about our world, and uh, they're very, I'm speaking for them, thank you very much for letting us uh, have these moments with you, and uh, I think uh, talking to your people might be good to uh, have you uh, share, and uh, 
uh, your, your people, and then let's just talk. All right. Okay. I'd be pleased to do that. And uh, Don, I, I want to welcome you all to the White House, and I, I thank you for arranging this meeting with you. I, I have to point out, and I don't mean to derogate what your task force has done and, and where you've gone, but to point out that no one can have access to all the information that a government can have uh, in a situation of this kind. And the, we are aware that the, the Sandinista government there has probably a sophisticated, a disinformation network that anything that we've ever seen, and it has invaded a great deal of our press. But I'd like to open with some statements here, and then I'll call on George. I felt for some time that the real story about Central America was well in place by the time I was sworn in in this position, and that's frequently overlooked. When the Sandinistas came to power in Nicaragua in July of 1979, they promised reforms and democracy for their country. And this promise was documented in a telegram they sent to the Organization of American States in June of 1979 in response to the unprecedented OAS resolution that called on Somoza to leave so that a democratic system with guaranteed rights could be established. Now what actually happened, the revolutionaries called on the Organization of American States and asked if they would appeal to Somoza to step down in order to stop the killing. And the organization said, what are your revolutionary goals? And back in writing came those goals, which was all the things we hold dear, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of religion, freedom of labor unions, free enterprise, and uh, a pluralistic democratic society. Now that was the promise that came back. Well, before I was sworn in in as president in January 1981, the following had happened in Nicaragua. Three Sandinistas and two real Democrats comprised the first junta. President Carter received Ortega and Robello in the White House in September 1979, a little two uh, uh, over two months after they had come to power in Nicaragua, and he offered a friendship and help. Sandinista commandantes then went to the Soviet Union in March of 1980 eight months after they came into power, and signed a party-to-party -party communique with the Communist Party of the Soviet Union that expressed basic agreement with the foreign policy goals of the Soviet Union. The next month, April 1980, the two Democrats on the Hunter resigned. One, Alfonso Robello, was currently a member of the Nicaraguan Democratic Resistance uh, di Directorate. The Western response to the Sandinistas for economic assistance was quick and generous. President Carter led the way, offering bilateral economic assistance and supporting loans in the Western multilateral banks. By the end of 1979, Soviet military planners were in Nicaragua. And by the time I took office, over 30 new military bases were either built or in the process of construction. There were no freedom fighters yet. By the time I took office, the Sandinista Army had become the largest in Central America and had received over 850 metric tons of military equipment from the Soviet bloc. There were no freedom fighters yet. The Sandinistas also began giving assistance to the communist guerrillas in El Salvador shortly after coming to power, and that still continues. President Carter suspended economic assistance to the Sandinistas in January 1981 just weeks before I was sworn in because of their exporting of revolution and aggression against El Salvador. Cardinal Obando y Bravo was particularly active against Somoza, and in 1980 the Sandinistas issued a communique specifically thanking him for his and the Church's contribution to the revolution. Yet later that year, relations began to become troubled between the Church and government. The Sandinistas began an early and clear pattern of repression and control over independent institutions like the free press, free labor unions, schools, and over real people's lives through their system of neighborhood Sandinistas defense committees, and later on through the use of intimidation from their so-called divine mobs. All these things were in place by January 20th, 1981, when I was inaugurated. And these processes of repression, aggression, and militarization have continued since I was sworn in. I think it's safe to say 
uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that the Sandinista army now is bigger than all the combined armies of the other Central American nations. What I've tried to do in the last six and a half years is constantly go back to the issue of genuine democracy in Nicaragua. The bipartisan peace plan that was just released last week was satisfying to me personally because its central point is the need for democracy in Nicaragua and outlines ways that it can be established. And the Democratic Central American presidents all agree that democracy in Nicaragua is the key to peace in the region, and that is reflected in the document they have just signed. There's firm bipartisan agreement on that point. Democracy was the central issue in 1979 when the Sandinistas promised it to the people of Nicaragua. It remains the issue today, and in our discussion later, I think we have plenty of evidence to show that, uh, that their promise is not kept and has gotten worse. And now I'll ask George to review the elements of the new bipartisan peace plan and the Central American plan signed in Guatemala mm -hmm. last Friday. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Mr. President. If I could also do as the President did, and that's a first step back historically a little bit, and talk about Central America again, because